Hello, welcome to this time of worship today. It's so beautiful on this great fall day that I had to come outside and uh, bring our call to worship to you from outside today with the beautiful leaves in behind me and the sun beating down. It's a great day. Glad that you are here and I hope that as we worship today you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship Him. Hear this call to worship from Psalm 19. O oh Lord, you are God, there is no other God but you. We renounce all that we have allowed to come between us. O Lord, we worship you. We praise and honor your name. We worship you on this day, Holy Lord, for your love, for your word, for all that you have given. O Lord, we thank you and praise you. We love you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word bursts forth into our lives like a glorious sunrise. You speak and our hearts rejoice. You command and our eyes are opened. The sound of your voice brings revival to our souls. Your words are purer than the finest gold. True and righteous one, living word, light our way. As we listen to your spirit, may the words of our mouths and the thoughts of our hearts be accepted in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Over mountains high, through the valleys low, God is good. Wherever we go, from the brightest days to the darkest nights, God is
nothing goes our way and it's just not our day our god is our god is good oh oh oh, 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 oh. god is good oh oh oh, 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 oh. oh the mountains high through the valleys low god is good wherever we go from the bright
eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 to 46. Now listen to another story. A certain nine owner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, and dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and built a lookout tower. Then he leased the vineyard to tenant the farmers and moved to another country. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the nine owners sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmer saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to the, this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, dragged him out of the vineyard, and murdered him. When the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, Why do you think he, he will do, those, do to those farmers? The religious leader replied, He will, wick, he will put the wicked men into a, to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. Then Jesus asked them, Didn't you ever read this from the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. Tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces. It will crush anyone it falls on. Falls on. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard about this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet.
The reading is from Philippians 3, verses 4 to 14. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through fault, faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that on one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already achieved perfection, or that I have already reached perfection. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Hi there. It's a beautiful October afternoon. I'm out here enjoying this great weather and I'm out here enjoying the fact that I am a Canadian. Yes, being a Canadian, I have a certain amount of privilege and a certain amount of blessings and a certain status that I enjoy. For instance, I can wear plaid anytime I want and I don't have to explain it. That just comes with being Canadian. Because I'm Canadian, I can do this without even trying. Oh yeah, first try. Some of the other things that I enjoy about being Canadian are universal health care. I have freedom. I can travel where I want, when I want, unless I want to go to the Maritimes, I guess, right now, but hey, there is there is that but generally I can do that I can participate in choosing government I think that I'm counted among the most blessed in our world simply because I call myself Canadian do you believe that I think it's true there is a status that comes with being Canadian a status that I didn't create a status that doesn't have anything really to do with me, but nonetheless, because I'm Canadian, I am a blessed person in the world that we live in. Paul in, in uh, first, not first, Paul in Philippians chapter three outlines the way that status works. Paul outlines for a group of people for uh, who understand status and who live by a code of of 
of standing and status within society and he outlines to them that whatever status they may have, whatever privilege they may enjoy, whoever they may be as a person within the society that they live, all of it pales in comparison to being found in Jesus Christ. There is a status, Paul believes, to be that comes with knowing Christ. The status has implications and meaning, but Paul understands and uh, but what Paul understands and how he conveys this standing is different than what the Philippian church and what you and I may think of when we think of the status that comes with knowing Christ. For Paul, to know Jesus is to experience relationship with him. In fact, in throughout the New Testament, whether it's in the gospel writings or as we think about um, Paul's writings or other writers of the New Testament, when they talk about knowing Jesus, they don't simply have a, a, a point of view which says, uh, we know about Jesus, we know about his teachings or his, his sayings as he went around the countryside preaching. We don't know about the, just about the details of his life when he ministered on the earth. To know Jesus is to have a relationship with him. And in Paul's understanding, to have this relationship with Jesus brings about a certain, under, a certain amount of standing, a certain status. This we remember from our journey through Romans, don't we? Paul talks about the fact that um, when we believe in Jesus, when we have faith in him and are saved because of this faith and enter into this relationship with him, we are adopted as daughters and sons of the Lord, of the Father. We become joint heirs along with Jesus in the blessings of being a part of the family of God. We become uh, people who are recipients of the glory of resurrection, which means that we will participate in eternal life eternal life through the resurrection of the dead when when uh, Jesus returns and this is all part of the status and standing that comes from being a part of the family of God from knowing Jesus through faith and while resurrection glory being daughters and sons of the king of kings uh, is the standard that standing that followers of Jesus inherit it is not necessarily lived out in the way that we might expect. Yes, Paul keys into a certain tendency that humanity possesses, uh, and w which is this, to cling to status and to live off the benefits of good standing. And Paul presents to the Philippian church as he expands upon the fact that, that uh, they understand they have this status of knowing Jesus. Um, he he presents a counter offer to them as they start to think about what the implications of having this standing as sons and daughters of Jesus might be. And his counter offer is this. If you want to, to embrace the status that you have with Jesus, if you want to really know who he is and experience the power of his resurrection, you will need to follow the model of Jesus. And so Paul uh, wraps all of this up as he did in chapter 2 from last week uh, in the context of humility. To have a relationship with Jesus infers that we have an understanding of the, of the characteristics of the Jesus whom we know. And if this Jesus who we say we know and have standing with and because of uh, is in us, then his character is in us and we work to emulate Jesus. And in this chapter, chapter 3, Paul work, um, invokes the image of the Christ Christological hymn from chapter 2. And remember that hymn that we read last week from uh, Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus who was was God did not view his standing as God as something to be grasped but emptied himself and took on the form of his creation became a human being and suffered and died so that uh, salvation 
and restoration and new life could be offered to his creation. This is the imagery that Paul says comes with the status of being a follower of Christ. And to illustrate this status, this, this imagery, Paul then uh, not only invokes or reminds us, calls us back to remind us about that Christological hymn, but he uses the same inferences for himself. He says and reminds us that he himself had every reason to be someone who counted on his status and uh, who f- would count himself among probably the most blessed people who were living on the face of the earth. Why? Because he was a Jew. He was a person who was a part of God's chosen people. He was born to the tribe of Benjamin which and could trace his lineage back to uh, this part of the original people of God. Not only was he a Jew who, sh- who s- should uh, enjoy certain standing, he was in fact uh, a Pharisee. And not just a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he says. I was someone who, in other words, upheld the law of God to the very letter. I was someone who w- could be counted as righteous in in terms of the law and I had every standing that comes or privilege that comes with the standing of being someone who is righteous in the eyes of the law not only that I was a persecutor of the church I vehemently pursued those who I viewed as being or were viewed as being against what the law had taught and so uh, I had every reason to grasp at my at glory And in fact, before he encountered Jesus in his um, in his conversion experience, Paul would have grasped at that status that comes from being a Jew and a Pharisee and a righteous one at that and would have lived off of that status. It would have been a way for him to enjoy uh, good standing in his community privilege in his amongst his brothers and sisters uh, his countrymen and uh, he would have been somebody and it would have been expected that he lived in this high uh, status of being a privileged person in his in his community and amongst his peers but Paul in following Jesus Regard, says that he regards all of that status, all of the standing that he enjoyed, all of the things that he thought were important and worthy of his time and effort and the, actually the pursuits of his life up to that point. He regards it all as rubbish, he says. I consider it all trash. In fact, the, the Greek word that is used to describe it in, the, in most of our translations, most uh, commentators say is actually a little bit too uh, mild. Paul is talking, actually uses a Greek word that could be better translated to say excrement. I, I view all of those privileges, all the status that I had, the righteousness that comes from the law as excrement in comparison to living and knowing, and knowing Christ and being one of his children. This is Paul's uh, This is Paul's understanding. This is Paul's explanation of what knowing Christ means. It means being able to forego these earth other privileges and and the status that comes from being a person of of high regard. Um, uh, It means being willing to forego some of the pursuits that people in his time were were wanting to put themselves up against. It means being willing to forego Um, maybe popularity or wealth or an ease of life because he viewed following Christ and knowing him even in his sufferings and and even in joining in his sufferings as far more valuable than any of those sorts of things. Jesus did not grasp at his glory, neither did Paul grasp at his status and he understands that and, and sees it for what it actually was. And Paul in this way in this passage is calling out the values of the world he lives in as values which miss the point. They're incomplete. They're not always bad in and of themselves. 
Paul doesn't think that the law is bad, for instance, or a desire to follow the law is bad, for instance. But um, they have. But these pursuits may have a tendency to swing people off into a tangent and become the goal of life rather than part of a faithful living out of relationship with their God and Creator. This is what Paul believes is, is at issue here, and this is what he starts to explain to them. And so I ask us this question as we think about what Paul has said here. What are the status elements that we might rest on, not only necessarily as Canadians, as uh, we've been having some fun thinking about this morning, today, um, what are the status elements that we might rest on perhaps as Christians, as people of the new uh, relationship, who maybe not people who, who pursue Torah or those sorts of things, but people who still understand that and fall victim and pray to the trappings of status. In fact, Paul writes this letter to the Philippian church because he understands that they probably too have a tendency to look upon themselves with a certain air because they are faithful followers of Jesus. So what are some of the things that we might um, uh, rest on? Of our, What elements of our status What might we think are important things to rest on? So we might be able to illustrate it like this. If I'm a, a good Christian who gives faithfully to the church 10% of my income or more, if I'm a, a person who tunes in weekly to the pastor's sermons or comes to church when uh, COVID isn't on, on a regular basis, uh, if I volunteer, if I do my work on the church board, if I'm there every time the, the doors are open, maybe I am fine. I am doing my part and everything is good. Paul is saying to us, uh, as he would say to the Philippian church, don't consider yourself, because you consider yourself a good, upstanding Christian, to be somebody who has status that they should rest on. Uh, sometimes when we think about this, we might even say this, I'm saved by faith alone, which Paul would say, yes, we are, and that's good enough, and we can simply go along and live our lives. Well, Paul is saying, don't simply rest upon your status as being a saved a uh, child of God who lives in, in that state. There's more to it. And we shouldn't cling to our status. We should desire to know Christ, to have relationship with Him, to experience Him, and have this ongoing, continual sense of growth, and maturing that comes from knowing who Christ is. Yes, these status points, whatever they may be, are not the point. And if they have become the point, they should be cast off as Paul cast off his status points, as he realized that being found in Christ is actually the real purpose of his life. And this is only realized in and through faith in him. Yes, Paul regards the status he enjoyed, even the good elements of faithfulness and law adherence, as excrement in comparison to having come into relationship with the one who gives real purpose and meaning in the present and in the future. Which is why he can pivot here and say, forgetting what is behind, I press on to the goal. And so, Paul understands. He he has a new status that comes from knowing Christ. He knows who Christ is and, and has this relationship with him, but he's not content to even cling to that status. He's not content to cling to a relationship as it stands with Jesus that comes through faith in him. He wants to press on and experience more. And Paul's words to the Philippian church are this, Maybe you don't cling to uh, your church attendance as your status. Maybe you actually do cling to your relationship and knowledge of Jesus as part of your status. And uh, maybe you do value this relationship with him, but don't stop there. This is not something where 
we come to a certain point and rest on our laurels and say, well, we've, we've reached the end. We've come to found the pinnacle or the plateau and this is where we're going to set up camp and stay. No, there is a progression in relationship. And while it is good to be in a certain place, while it is good to know Christ, there is more to experience. And Paul would have us understand that we are never have never finally or fully arrived, that there is always more to experience, always more to understand. And in fact, this is one of the downsides of the holiness tradition that we find ourselves in uh, when we talk about entire sanctification and things of that nature. Sometimes we have, we have wrongly and to our detriment interpreted our, ourselves giving up our, our whole selves to, to God as the end goal of our faith and uh, of our experience of Jesus. But in fact, that's just the beginning. That's just the next part of the ongoing process of maturing and growing and experiencing more and more of Christ. Because as Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He wants to, to grow and grow and grow. And so Paul says, forget the achievements that you have accumulated, as good as they may be, as worthy of praise as they may be, as uh, putting you in good standing as they may do. Forget those things and move forward. Strive to press on and move ahead. Become closer and closer and closer to Jesus. We don't worry about uh, losing our status or the things that we were had clung to, but instead we understand that those things in and of themselves are not the goal. The life of resurrection is the goal. And the power of which this resurrection we will experience one day when, when Jesus returns and we join him in resurrection life, we will experience one day, we don't fully experience it yet, but it will inform how we live today by keeping us moving forward until we reach the end of the race. It is this knowledge of the resurrection prize that awaits, that keeps us going and moving forward every day. Now, again, sometimes our tradition has said, uh, interpreted these verses as saying, you know what, we're looking forward to heaven and uh, we're going to just long for that day. No, Paul is saying we work hard every day to grow and mature and one day when we reach the end, when we have worked till the very last, we will receive this prize for which we have full hope and confidence to receive. Um, this is how, why it informs us today. We know that it is there at the finish line and we continue to work hard and strive for it each day. The power of the resurrection that we will share in does in fact not only inform how we live today, but it does still reach back from the end and work in our lives today. I do believe that Paul believes that we are resurrection people, that we are not just clinging to a future hope, but the, the power of the resurrection is renewing us and transforming us today into the people that God wants us to be. Um, and this is how it works. It transforms us as we commit to living in relationship with Jesus. It transforms us into people who are maturing and growing and more mature than we were last week or last month or last year as we we grow in this relationship with Jesus. It transforms us as we do the work of relationship. This is the, the way the future informs the present. We engage in spiritual disciplines, prayer and fasting and reading the Bible, engaging in worship, serving others. Those sorts of disciplines, we do those things because we are being transformed now and we know the future has uh, a great prize in store. This is how the, the future informs the present, how the resur future resurrection reaches back and begins transforming us to now. 
to be about the work of the one in whom we are in relationship is how uh, we are being transformed as we serve others, as we establish his kingdom, as we do acts of kindness and service and are agents of peace and justice in this world that terribly needs a coming together and to be united as we are examples of unity and love this is how the transformation the the power of the resurrection reaches back and transforms the world in which we live in today not only in us but through us this is the work that paul calls us to to being about the work of the one in whom we are in relationship with And this is sometimes where suffering comes into play because Paul again wraps this up in humility and suffering. We know that doing the work of the one of the one that we serve puts us into places where we may be at odds with those around us, where the work that we are doing may not be appreciated, where our the transformation that's going on in us and through us may not be accepted or well received. This is the way that God works and uh, this is the way suffering comes into play and it also means that we renounce the values that are held by the culture that we live in Uh, we don't seek power and status and wealth and the things that the world around us seeks as status symbols we cast them off and work towards the prize which lays out in front of us like a runner seeking to finish the race. It's not that we can't have things or, or possessions or positions or power or any of those sorts of things, but we are not motivated by such things and therefore may indeed forego the, those comforts that, are, that such things afford as we press on towards other more valuable prizes. This is the posture to which we are called. I want to use this Canadian illustration one more time. We have the privilege, I've already said, in the status that comes with being Canadians, but you know, we're also called to be good citizens of the country, which has certain ramifications, doesn't it? It means we agree to live by the rule of law that is put out in front of us. It means that we agree to respect our neighbors and their freedoms because we are good Canadians. It means that we pay our taxes and contribute to the society that we live in. It means that we are people who volunteer and and work and are part of uh, uh, industrious part of our society. These are part of being good what good citizens of the country means so our status is wonderful as Canadians but it comes with the responsibility to keep up the good work of citizenship Paul understands that our status as Christians is beautiful and wonderful but it is not what is to be grasped at we need to be good citizens of the kingdom who do our part who work hard who press on towards the goal to finish the race to claim the prize and as we do so Let God do his transforming work in us and through us as we experience the power of his resurrection as we know Christ.
as we leave this time of worship today, receive this benediction. We're looking forward to another time together next week in person on Thanksgiving Sunday. It's going to be a wonderful time to celebrate God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And until then, hear these words. Go forth in the name of the living word, the one whose words bring forth the fruit of the kingdom in your own lives. Amen.